the, who um, wants control over the recordings um, is the person who does it. And you'll see up at the top, there's a, a message that says that the recording has begun um, and that there's a privacy policy that we have um, agreed to. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so this is the roadmap. We're on the session three. We're still addressing your needs. We're kind of char charting a plan. And we have Dr. Zynga here who's going to, oh, there she is. Uh, I, I see she's made it into the room. So um, she's going to tell us some of her experiences. We've been working with uh, Dawn for, for many, many years, um, and it's always such a pleasure to work with her. She has a lot of experience and insights from teaching uh, small to extremely large classes. So I'm really happy. Uh, a lot of you had identified that you would wanted to hear about people who were doing this and what it looked like. So I'm so thankful for Dawn to be able to come and give you some of that insight and experience. Um, uh, last week, this I was thinking it would be like last week on this show, you, you remember we talked about trauma-informed pedagogy where we talked about predictability, flexibility, connection, and empowerment. And this was mainly addressing some of the major issues that came out, um, uh, talking about how can we um, design these courses um, so that we keep that human perspective and engagement, but also make it really manageable. So we're going to continue um, talking along those lines this week, in addition to giving you those examples and hearing from Don. And I just want to point out um, that all the resources are available online. We're keeping archives, our records, um, our PowerPoints, and everything that we reference as far as uh, the literature and the resources are available on these on these websites. And I'm going to point out to very specific things later in the session so you can see specifically. There, for those of you who may be coming to a lot of them, there's a little bit of overlap, but that's only because those are the leading practices that we're trying to encourage, and they're just with a slightly different lens. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about humanizing online um, and how we can do that considering in the context of large classes, so how we can do it uh, to manage the workload. And then we're going to hand it off to Dawn to give us some examples and uh, talk about her experiences. Um, and then you can have an opportunity to engage with, with her and talk about, you know, how did you actually do this? And it's not just uh, theoretical. So the human, humanizing online last week, um, we talked about the liquid syllabus. So kudos to Netta for actually doing the liquid syllabus. I decided to call it a skeleton syllabus because we don't actually, I didn't, we don't have a tool on campus where I could just say point you and I didn't know how difficult it was. So it would be really interesting to, if you uh, click the link to see Netta put in the chat how she did it. But um, basically you could still just use Sakai and make the course available sooner. So we're going to talk about these three components about the skeleton syllabus as soon as possible. Um, and then the opportunity to connect with your students also as soon as possible, and then how you can do some adaptive teaching even in a large class. So if you don't want to use a tool like uh, Netta did, which um, I want to go check that out, maybe we'll pull it up later and, and give a, deep, a deeper dive, you can request your fall course as soon as possible. I think they're available now as I, I did a check last night and I saw that they were available to, to request uh, as long as you're the instructor of record. You could create your fall course and you could put some bare bones information, including a, a very brief outline of what the expectations are for this course it, so that you can kind of nail that down so students know what to expect. And maybe a welcome video announcement from you saying, you know, that how excited you are for them to come and sort of uh, describing what you're, you're hoping that um, the experience will be like through the fall and just recognizing that we're working through this together. Um, and I'm just pointing out that in the site info inside of Sakai, you can actually start developing your entire course but hide everything except for those two uh, pieces so you could have an announcement and you could have course information and so as students get enrolled they will get this information and if they're if they're kind of keen and they want to check it out they can come see this and we'll talk a little bit later about um, student um, supports so that they even know where to go because our first year students won't actually have this um, knowledge so um, this is from uh, Michelle uh, uh, Brock McCansky, I think her name is. Um, she talks about these humanizing principles. So uh, humanizing online is a, is a merger between culturally responsive teaching and universal design for learning, which we have talked about before. Um, and so the, the three steps that she talks about is the cultivating your human presence. Um, you're not a robot and how you can do that. 
And then uh, she talks about identifying your high opportunity students so that you can make contact. Um, we were talking about gardens earlier and she uses a garden metaphor talking about how um, when you have a full garden, you don't actually need to water all the garden equally. There's some plants that need a little more care and attention. And so she um, she suggests that you survey your students to begin with and find out who your high need students are. Um, and so you can kind of tailor some of those experiences for those uh, students. Um, and then she talks about being a warm demander and just monitoring engagement. And this doesn't necessarily need to be all on the instructor. This is the role that we can help hopefully work with you and your uh, teaching assistants and your course coordinators so that this work is distributed, but also still creates this warm environment for, for learning. Um, I, uh, there's a video here. Um, Andrew McAllister is my colleague from um, from OCAD U, and he actually has some really great um, equipment, like high-end equipment, because it's an art and design school, but he does talk about perfect being the enemy of good, and sometimes I change that to be perfect as the enemy of done. So sometimes, you know, just like, you know, it's just get it finished, do the best you can, People actually, the students really respond to that human touch. As long as the audio is clear, it doesn't have to be a completely perfect high-end video. He's using like some really amazing equipment, but you know, the webcam and just a, a basic lapel mic or your, um, even the computer microphone is not so bad. And the, we talked about this before about how you can build your framework. And then as the course goes on, you can just sort of pop in and do a two to three minute um, just check in. This is what we're seeing is happening. These are the themes. This is what you can look forward to next week. And so you don't have to lose that human presence. Um, you can inject it and it doesn't always need to be live. And you could save those uh, moments for these live sessions, where whether it's office hours or it's some very key and intentional moments. So she talks about this is all available on this really cool infographic in this presentation. She talks about um, as you're facilitating. So the work that you do now to build your course can be just this framework um, and then you can you can do the facilitation. So this is where you are essential is in facilitating the learning through the term. So you're going to be looking at your presence, um, your empathy and awareness. Maybe I feel like I will get Madeline to pop in a little bit here because you had some great insights with last time we were um, chatting about this slide and I'm sick of hearing my voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, so I guess um, my my thoughts around this is uh, thinking about that presence and like Julia said, is just something quick each week. And if even if you don't feel comfortable with a video, even some of that presence of uh, this is what we heard this past week in the forums. And here's an example of uh, one of the students said X and you can get uh, their permission to use some of their information, but allowing them to see that you're there and you're present in the moment and what's happening in that um, in that space and with that content. Uh, I guess around uh, empathy and awareness, and maybe I did have some good ideas yesterday and hopefully I'll bring them back up here, but um, I think there's uh, ways in, in which that students will see that and feel like you're individually checking in on them, even if you are checking in on the entire class in an online environment. So in a big, huge class, you might say, you know, I hope everybody's doing okay, but it might not resonate as much as when they're looking at it individually, which I think is an interesting opportunity we have in an online environment. Um, the survey in uh, week one and some ideas of icebreakers. Uh, Julia, I'm not sure if you're getting to the idea of um, thinking about having your picture in your Sakai. Are you gonna talk about that? Oh, you're muted. I'm muted. I was trying to find why that link was, was broken. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yes, about the profile picture. Actually, no, I don't have that. But as you'll notice that everybody under their profile settings has the opportunity to update their photo. And I make that often a first assignment, a get to know you assignment is to change that for students. And I, I recommend that you do that for yourself too. The, it's the one uh, profile that is not linked to all the other ones on campus. So, um, you have to go do that manually. So you don't have to use a photo of yourself. It could be something that's representative. It could be your tropical flowers. It could be your cat. Um, it could be anything, but it's a nice idea to build that connection. 
and sort of as a, a bit of an icebreaker, especially if you're doing some small group type of activities in forums, you know, that first one might be, here's a picture and explain your picture. So they might have a picture of you and, you know, traveling, or it might be that these are your flowers and what does that represent about you? So having those kind of icebreakers allows to build some of that community within those forums within your class, uh, but also puts a bit of a, a face to the course as well for, for the students. So those I think are some really key things that are really kind of small but impactful that can help in terms of that presence, empathy, and awareness. Um, I'm just noting, sorry about that link being broken. I will definitely update that link and I'll add it in. Um, I, I reference um, Brokansky. Is now exiting. <laughs> well, right then. <laughs> um, I referenced her work earlier too, so you can get to it from somewhere else. Um, so I'll a lot of these things sound like they're high intensity and they're going to be difficult to do for very large classes. So the other key point that a lot of people were like, how do I do this without it taking over my, my entire life? So we wanted to point out a couple of the, the really uh, simple features that are built into Sakai that allow you to use automation for good. Um, I, I, I am highly suspicious of um, uh, artificial intelligence to do good, but I think there are some actual really good cases where it can be useful. For example, um, if you turn on the statistics tool just by going to site info and turn on statistics um, in this course that I have added that's a joinable site, I can see that 27% um, of the people in the class have not actually logged in yet. So that's a good indicator of, you know, they're not attending, right? So Clicking isn't necessarily learning, but at least knowing that people have come in and how many times um, and what they're clicking on and what they're looking at is a very helpful indicator. Um, so that's something that course coordinators often uh, will kind of check. Um, and so in particular, there's also a, a, a tool in forums called statistics and grading. And so if you're using the forums tool, it can give you a quick overview. So these students in my class, I've blurred out their names, but they have not been posting. So I was able to contact them early and then repeatedly. And so one person in particular, to be honest, three of those people are actually uh, instructors. So the, the, I didn't really expect them to, but the one person who has a really low uh, posting, I did contact her and I said, listen, are you, is everything okay? Is there something I can do to help you succeed? Um, what can, you know, is everything, you know, what, what, um, what challenges are you facing that I can uh, support you in? And she was like, yes, my, my kid was in the hospital. Thank you for reaching out. I do need a little bit more time. I don't want to drop the course. I will be doing it. So I was able to like help her um, guide through what that is, what, um, what needed to be done for her to finish. This is a lot more challenging, obviously in a very large course, um, but you can do a sorting by uh, seminar so that you can, so that your TA, so if you are using the forms for that kind of thing, you can kind of check, but even just to create a group, I know that, um, um, uh, I'm not sure if Astrid's here, but in Earth Science, uh, Rick would use, used to go make sure anybody who hadn't logged in, he would send them a message within that first week, even if, and he would just create like a BCC and it would be to the first um, like 100 students who hadn't logged in and just say, the course has started, it's really fast, it's going to be five weeks, you need to get going. Um, and so it's just identifying people who haven't gotten started. And these are just simple ways to kind of help keep students on track to let you know, let them know that you, you care about, about their attendance. Um, I also liked, sorry, before I say that, I do like to let students know that I have that ability to track. So um, I'm just seeing about, um, I, I don't want it to be like a gotcha situation. It's sort of like, by the way, this it has this ability and I will be checking it just so that they are, are fully aware. I think full disclosure is really important. Um, so Netta says that she's obsessed with checking it. Yeah, I find it, <laughs> I find it helpful to know like how people are doing. It's a really useful thing and I'm glad to see other people are using it. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the role of self-assessment. So built into lessons, um, we um, and there are lessons um, sessions that are specifically about that. There's this ability to add, add these little questions at the end of each lesson where you can sort of get at what the key points were. And then students can just sort of test it themselves and get the answer immediately. You can use this for grading, but I think it's also a really great way for students to just be like, did I even read that properly and do a little bit of a quick self check? So that's something that can be automated. It doesn't require high maintenance. And from your instructor perspective, you can see who is answered and how well they're doing. So you actually know if, you, if you're on track. So it can be sort of like a, a thing that you can moderate your, um, 
your instruction. If you're like, oh, they're really not getting this, maybe I need to revisit this and you'll kind of add it into the next session um, to kind of revisit it. Or you do your little video check in and say, I noticed that a lot of people um, thought a community of inquiry was something completely different. That's really interesting. Maybe we should address it. Students do not have access to statistics. It is only for instructors. TAs do not have access to statistics either. Um, but if you turn, if you allow them to have uh, instructor access, then that's how they can see that. Um, I'm just revisiting that this infographic, which apparently can't get the link to, but I will share it to you. I promise as soon as um, I get a chance. Um, Michelle talks about um, course design and all of these elements, but the one in particular for large classes that we can address is this, this point about choice and allowing different ways of expressing uh, what people know. We talk a lot about this in the um, assignment, the assessment sessions. Um, so I just wanted to, to reiterate about authentic assessment and maybe um, Madeline wants to jump in after I talk about this, just about how problematic um, high stakes exams are. And I know that they are have historically been a standard for, for first year um, large classes because of the, the number of students that we have that we kind of want to design it this way. But there are many different reasons why having a high stakes exam is problematic. So we are um, encouraging looking at authentic assessment. And um, there's a lot of, um, recordings and resources available at the um, at the other um, session site, but I just want to quickly go over a couple of those things. Madeline, do you want to jump in about exams or did I? Yeah, no, I think you, you've covered it well. And I think that we want to really focus in on the students learning and with authentic assessment, we can do that. If we are just doing multiple choice that is uh, something that they're just regurgitating. I know we it, it's hard in this big in large classes when we're used to doing some multiple choice and true and false and that, but we we are going to have some challenges. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat this, but I think technically there's going to be a lot of challenges if there's a class of say a thousand trying to all get onto Sakai and be doing uh, these type of uh, randomized multiple choice, true and false type questions. We're in the process of figuring out what we can do to mitigate what might happen. Um, but again, if there's a way that you can just not do those, uh, and that is that is the the best advice I have. Secondly, uh, virtual proctoring. Uh, again, we don't have a stance yet here at Brock. I'm hoping for something soon-ish. But with that, we know that students can work around virtual proctoring. I think it's a it's a weird time to be really doing high level surveillance on our students uh, and having them to do these types of high stake things. Uh, so again, virtual proctoring, not the best route, but I know it's kind of an ingrained thing that we've been doing as instructors. But if there's a time to change, I would say that's now. And um, how can we create really great questions that students could work on for a day? And you know, then they have to do some multiple choice questions, but they can do that over a 24-hour period and it's more authentic in terms of what they're learning we want their learning to be so um again you know I, I can't harp on this enough if there's a way to get a, get our thinking away from virtual proctoring and think about how do we assess large groups uh with really great questions but that's on a broader time frame that's going to be our best approach in large classes so more to come on that in the next little while i'm sure and a lot of people were wondering like what could, what this could possibly look like. And so I just wanted to point out that um, these are the top three video audio presentations, high frequency, low stakes testing and forum discussions we talked about last week. And then tomorrow we'll be talking about open book take home exams, peer evaluation, reflective papers. Um, but there is a whole bunch of other issues that people wanted to talk, different assessment methods that people wanted to talk about. So uh, we'll be gathering resources and adding them there. And of course, um, a lot of you have reached out individually and talked and said like, well, what about my particular course? And that's really the preferred way to do this. Please reach out. We are happy to talk to you about your specific course and take you through how it could look um, in your context. Um, but we just want this is kind of an opportunity for get a broad overview. So please don't feel too panicked about like this, um, all this information. It's just take, take it, uh, take it in and then, oh, I'm interested in this little bit. And then please reach out and let us know. And again, uh, I have a little exclamation point about the to point out high frequency and low stakes for the testing. Um, again, I'm going to 
talk about Astrid and Earth Science, who has made like exceptional um, uh, variants in when the, the testing occurs, because we've noticed that even just the load on the server requires some kind of uh, very careful consideration. So if you are looking at doing this, please reach out to us as well so that we can ensure that there's not two giant quizzes happening at the same time that could crush and melt Sakai, um, because nobody wants to get a thousand emails because the the test went down especially when it's being offered over the weekend or whenever it's happening so please reach out to us i know these are the recommendations and i know that in your context it may not be um, viable but if you are going to go with one particular method please let us know so that we can support you and not um you know have have a a, a crisis on our hand um, a lot of these things are going to be uh, pivotal in the role of teaching assistants. So I want to point out that there are a series of asynchronous workshops running all through the summer um, for teaching assistants. If you feel like you would like to know more about a lot of these things, like creating an online community, uh, facilitating, facilitating discussions online, using feedback, universal design for learning, teaching accessibility, ethical dilemmas, uh, grading strategies. If, you, if you're interested, you are welcome to join in on these or please um, uh, suggest your TAs uh, come and join. We've been getting a, quite a, a lot of um, TAs um, joining in. They're being run through Sakai so that you have the experience of using it from a student perspective. So you can also uh, practice using the tools that that most of this stuff will be happening on. Um, and those instructional support assistants will be beginning in July. Um, so that um, they will be supporting um, two per faculty as well. So we'll be having additional support for teaching assistants. Um, um, and um, the TA workshops are not being done synchronously, so they're all being done through an asynchronous method. So once they get hired, we can maybe um, look at um, getting them into the system. Most of these are actually starting um, in July and then we'll keep, keep going. So they'll be replicated by faculty as well. So we will be able to do something um, and we can also do things custom. So I know like Psych 1F90 has 20 TAs or something, right? So we are happy to do something for Psych 1F90 within the context of how your assessments will be run. Um, for example, and for classics is going to be trying a new tool. We're happy to do that, that um, uh, per faculty, per course. So please just reach out and let us know. Um, these are sort of like broad things. If people aren't really sure where they're being assigned, they're, they can start now. Um, and then we can do some uh, sort of really specific targeted support so um, just around that as well, because I think it's important for us to clarify that we can't require TAs and markers and marker graders to go to this, uh, given their contracts de generally will not start until September 1. So from our perspective, we can just strongly encourage, or if you know that, your that you have some students that will be TAs, providing them with this opportunity to engage in this, they get a certificate, it's seen as professional development, um, that's important. It's obviously it would be great for them to be able to do it over the summer. We can't mandate it. Uh, that said, when you are doing your allocation of hours for uh, teaching assistance, assistance, we will have more and all of this will be ongoing through August and, and September. So allocating some time within their uh, hours to do some of this professional development is what we're really uh, hoping faculty will will consider. So just wanted to throw that out there. And Don makes a great point that so we have our regular certificate program, which these can contribute to, but we're also offering a very specific certificate in online learning or uh, yeah, online teaching and learning in higher education. So uh, for teaching assistants. So this is a, a very specific context, but they'll get an additional certificate if they participate through the summer, which she says is motivating. And that's really I'm glad to hear that um, we're always happy to work with TAs or so like Brock TAs are awesome. Uh, further to supports. A lot of people asked, well, what about students? So we just want to point out that the Brock U for You campaign is beginning um, uh, with Start Smart Start in July, running through. They're going to do a Brock U 101, which is early academic support. So this is A to Z Learning Services in partnership with Student Experience and Community Life. I'm sorry, I always get that name wrong, but you get the point. They're going to be offering a series of um, sessions for students, student facings to help support them and what it means to go online. Um, we are offering these sessions uh, at, about building community to faculty. We had one last week, so there's a recording where um, Maggie Whitfield from uh, uh, Learning Services talks about 
um, what that looks like, what the program looks like, what's going to be offered, and that recording is available for you to see. But also, if there's something specific that you feel you need or you would like, I encourage you to contact um, A to Z Learning Services or through us, um, come to the session tomorrow, however you want to kind of inform that. I feel like you also have a unique perspective because you're working with these first year students. And if there's something you want to try and you feel like it's not being addressed, then this is the opportunity to come together. So there's the building the community is, is a twofold. We want to build a community between instructors and their support services, but we also want to build community for our learners. Um, and as part of that, uh, Madeline and uh, Julie Finnegan and uh, <laughs> I have to change the and Athena Coleman have designed this uh, tips for online learning for students. And so this is a resource that's available for you that you can modify. It's Creative Commons license uh, just about even if you're not going to be doing synchronous lectures, but if you're going to be doing drop in sessions or if any kind of opportunity where people are going to have to turn their camera on or going to be using um, the microphone like some some things to consider. So we have this uh, resource available and posted for you if you want to reuse it or modify it for your context. Um, it's, there's two pages here, um, things to things to do before the call and what to do during the call. Um, and so there are some things that you didn't think you would have to mention, but they, it's really helpful to make sure that everybody um, setting expectations of, of what a behavior looks like online is really important. We do have our regular code of conduct, and this is just sort of clarifying in this new world what that can look like. Um, so I wanted to get some, so uh, there's two points to this. I wanted to point out that forms is a great way for you to get some um, mid, mid, early to mid level feedback. I know that um, uh, Tanya is using Qualtrics to get some feedback from students beforehand. And the forms are also another way that you could do that if, you, if Qualtrics is a little too complicated for you. But it's also during the course a way for you to get a little bit of adaptive feedback. You can be done as anonymous. It can be or you can collect the information. And so I actually want to get some feedback from you um, on this link. I'll go back to this after because I'm going to pass this off. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about the role that formative feedback plays in a large class and how it can help guide where you're going just to let make sure that the what you're meeting the needs of your students so that if you know if there's something small that you could change you could actually get feedback on that obviously you're not going to change the entire content or course but there is something like how are these sessions working for you was this is this okay doing it this way what do you need a little bit more of and a uh, simple start stop continue can be a, a good way to do that um and so we are giving you the opportunity to give us a start, stop, continue on how these sessions are going in addition for you to see what that can look like um, from a student perspective. And I recommend that you try and incorporate them into your courses. Without um, taking up any more time, I'm really happy to kind of pass this off to uh, Dr. Zinga. Don has been, as I said before, a friend of CPI for a very long time. Um, I really learned a lot from her experiences putting uh, courses online uh, when she used to have to fly up to remote communities and then she was like, maybe I could do this online and she did some really innovative stuff. Um, so for those of you who don't know her, I'm pretty sure most of you do. She's a professor in child news studies, also the associate dean of social science um, in graduate studies and research, and I believe still the acting uh, AVP of research. Um, so Don, I just uh, appended your slides onto here so you could take control of this presentation or you can load it up, whatever you feel most comfortable about. Take take control. That's perfect. Awesome. I love that the slides are here. Thank you. No problem. So hi, everyone. I've been dropping in and out of these courses that CPI is offering as much as I can, uh, because even though I have a lot of experience with online, I'm always learning new things. So I'm excited. We were just talking today with my team about adding in the checklist that Madeline likes to have in her courses. So you can always learn something new and things are always changing. So I'm going to focus on supporting students transition to online course engagement. And so I'm going to talk to you about design choices, rethinking your course, which I think is one of the most important things, effectively deploying resources, which sort of goes in with that, and then end with social connection and relationships, which Julia has already been talking a fair bit about in terms of how you actually create a community within your course and make those connections which makes it much easier for the students to adapt. And I'll be drawing on my different experiences. Uh, in Child and Youth Studies, we have one of the largest 
service learning courses in the university and the instruction component of it is done completely online. So what I found really important is to choose an organizational structure and stick to it. So unless you're teaching a course about organization, your main objective is not to get students to figure out an organization from module to module or however you're organizing your course, but to get them into the content. So the sooner you can get them acclimated to this is how this course works, the better. Now that doesn't mean that you are static. So for example, I change within my structures. So the online course I'm teaching right now, it's organizational structures within a module or they have an instruction section, they have an activity section, there's a child and youth voice section, an assessment section and a reading section. They always appear in the same order. So students always know where things are and what the flow is. But for example, within instructions, sometimes I give them a voice over PowerPoint. Sometimes I include a TED talk. So I'll change things up in the section, but the section always is in the same place and runs the same way. Uh, also, when you're building it, repeat instructions. We could all wear a shirt that says it's in the syllabus. And they have the syllabus and they should be reading the syllabus. But when they go online, you have to remember now they're going to be in all kinds of online courses. They'll get confused going from place to place. So, for example, in my reading section, the way it works is they have a selection of readings to choose from. So I always include that instruction right above the reading saying, remember, choose one reading and choose one article to reflect on in your module reflection so that if they're popping into the course, and they get confused they don't have to go back to check the syllabus they don't email me saying wait what do i have to do here again i've just repeated the instruction there as an ease of reference for them so i tend to do that in most of the sections i use my activity section as reminders of things that they should be doing at this point so you want your organizational structure to work for you and to actually lessen your workload so putting in those reminders feels personal to the students keeps them from having to go look and then keep some of the unnecessary emails down. Going online is the perfect time to rethink your course. In fact, you may drive yourself crazy trying to take your face to face course and then just transition it online as is. They don't transition. Because there are things you can do online that you can't do face to face and there are things you can do face to face that you can't do online. However, what you can do is meet the same objectives. It just might be a different path to that objective than you would do in face to face. So one of the reasons we took our large course online is because we needed critical reflection and that was not happening in a big group of 450 students. Like it was very hard to to um, get them to do that in a face to face class of 450. So we can actually get better outcomes in terms of the learning that we want online than we were getting face to face, which is why we took it online. However, I still just spent um, an hour, an hour and a half speaking with my team with that course because now that they can't go to the settings face to face, we have to redesign that component. So we were talking about what that redesign looks like. So we did a quick fix when we had to pull them out. But for the new one, we actually wanted to rethink it. We're changing the assessment. And that's the other thing is when you're rethinking it, and this ties into what Julia was saying about the courses and how you want to try to avoid a lot of multiple choice. So I do use quizzes but they're self reflective quizzes. So they're completion based. I don't care what their grade is. It just gets them through some of the key points that I want them to have gotten from the module that they're working on. So that would be a high frequency, low impact way of testing them and giving them some self-reflective information. What I do weight really heavily is their module reflection. So each module they need to post a reflection and they have a guide of how exactly I want it done. Because again, I. I don't need to test them on the structure. I'm happy to give them the structure. I want to see the thinking. So I do everything I can to support the thinking. So I give them a very detailed structure of how they do the module post, what headings they're supposed to use. 
And that's weighted heavily because the students will automatically gravitate to things that are weighted heavily. And they, if they have to make hard choices, will blow off things that don't count for as much. So because the modules are important to me, that's where I put a heavy piece of their assessment. And it also matches the work that they're doing, right? Because if you want them to invest there and spend the time, you need to reward them for doing that. So don't make a duplicate of your face-to-face -face course. Actually rethink what are your learning outcomes and how can you obtain those in this new environment? Consider what online offers that you can use to your advantage in, your, in this course. So I think quizzes are really easy um, once you've got them built. They work beautifully. And you can provide options for students so they have a sense of control and choice because they need some sense of control and choice in their environments and you'll get more engagement that way. So you give them a few options. They can do group work if they want, but don't make it mandatory. So you could do individual, you could do group, um, give them some options in what they're doing. The course that I'm working on right now, um, we contacted Anthony Kinnick because he has that really great um, piece that was in the Brock News and we've modified his assignment to fit within the course. So they're all playing with WordPress right now. We just released all the information to them. But we had a scaffold assignment. So we had them do a proposal and then a draft and then we released WordPress. So it's all the way you set, you think about it and you reconceptualize your course. Use your resources to your greatest effect. We, we're good at doing this in face to face because we do it all the time. You know, you think about your what you want the TAs or marker graders doing in online. You can think about it differently. So from my perspective, it would be a waste of my resources to have 20 TAs giving the same presentation live when I can record it and have great quality control. And then have the TAs deployed for the real interaction piece so that they can focus on that without having to try to be delivering content and worrying about controlling tech issues. And then you can even break them up into smaller groups than you would have in a normal seminar or offer different times that they can actually connect with the TA and do the discussion piece. So you want to think about using your TAs and marker graders differently. If part of your pedagogy is having that mentorship of TAs and it's important to you that they get to present, then you can move to a model where you have two or three TAs doing the recordings each week. Have them record in advance, send you the recordings so you can give them feedback and then they produce a final recording that then gets put up onto the site. So then they get their mentorship, they get the experience, but you still have the quality control and you're still not wasting a lot of hours on something that can be recorded instead of everybody doing it live and having to deal with the tech. You can think about your interactive components differently. So having live office hours or drop in times. Just thinking, how can they best support students in this environment? <clears throat> Not how you've traditionally had them support them face to face. And then the last part is really the most important part. It's a social connection and adaptation. So we were talking about profile video or profile pictures earlier. It's a requirement in my courses that you make a profile picture available. The only rules are it should not be an offensive picture, but if you want to be represented by the Blue Jays because it's your favorite team, all the power to you. Um, some people like to change their videos and I also include a course orientation that I find very important as well as netiquette and what an online learning community is. So I stress to them one of the reasons we need the videos is because we're naturally drawn to visual representations. So if we have a video, whether it's your face or it's your, you know, your favorite cartoon character, or anime character, we will start recognizing that image as representing you and it makes for a better interaction. So it's one of their first assignments and then we check it and we give them feedback and we also give them the exact instructions for how to do it. Even ask them to check with somebody else because usually what they forget is to move it from private to visible. And so they see it and they don't know what the problem is. So if you check with a friend, you know that you changed that piece. I also restrict students from emailing me. 
So they can only email me in Sakai using messages, um, largely because I have way too much email and then I know right where they are. The second piece is they can only email me even there if it's personal or confidential. So part of creating the online community is I have a forum and when it's running well and my schedule isn't insane, I go in there and I put in messages like, Shannon, that's awesome. That's exactly the right answer. So the students start answering themselves. So they'll post things like, oh, Grace, don't worry about it. It's on page three of the syllabus halfway down. And sometimes they copy and paste elements in and that's open 24 seven. So I tell them I won't actually answer it. The way you reinforce it is when they email you, you email back and say, that's an awesome question. It should be in the forums. I've posted it and answered it there. And you usually only have to do that for a few weeks and then the forums go crazy. But you do need to be able to have that time to do the reinforcement and to pop in the forums and put in those comments because the students will see that you'll go in and correct if somebody wasn't quite right or you know, thank the people that posted the information so you didn't have to. And then you get a really active um, community happening. I also do reach out to the students. So with my course coordinators, I have an amazing team, some of whom are on this chat. We reach out and identify students. If they're not posting, if they don't seem to be connecting and just say, you know, notice that you haven't been posting. Just wanted to let you know we're here for you. We can come up with alternate plans. We just need to connect and figure out how we can support you. I've had a number of students who responded to that and then told us afterwards that they wouldn't have, they would have just dropped or abandoned the course because they didn't feel like they could reach out. So making that connection can really make a difference. I hate being on video, but it makes a huge difference to my students. So all of my modules start with a two to five minute max video where I tell them what I expect them to get out of the module. Uh, sometimes I have things about assignments. So if they just got grades back, I might tell them the, the top wonderful things in the assignments and the things that people most needed to work on in the assignments. Sometimes it's random things. So it might be something about the news or it might be something about, hey, you're halfway through the course. Like, look at how much you've done. Take a minute to actually look and see what you've done and what's ahead. And those really seem to connect with them. The other way is you can have, um, I guess you could call them icebreakers. I haven't thought of them that way, but sometimes I have them post when they first start a course. You know, what are you most looking to get out of this course? What are you most nervous about? Or I'll even just ask them, you know, what did you do this summer? And it's just a way of them starting to interact and get to know each other. But I would say that's the number one piece. If you want to have a successful online course is you need to get them connecting both with you. I do not make perfect videos. I try to do one take videos as much as possible. And in fact, uh, just my last module, I had to post two videos because I redid it twice and it still kept cutting out. So I, I just told them, sorry, you've got two videos today because I ran into tech problems and no matter what I do, it cuts out at 13 minutes. So it's continued in the next one. And I've only, let me see, I have run these large courses for a number of years now. I think I've had three comments that were a little snarky about, you know, why is your cat in your video? I've had way more pictures about why isn't your cat in more videos? And how many cats do you have? And also one was like, oh, why don't you go to like that professional studio that the university has where you can record all your lectures? At the time there was no professional studio. I just responded that I preferred it a live, more natural experience. So most students actually prefer the done and good enough, not the perfect. And so between forums and messages in Sakai, I stay connected to the students. Sometimes I try to work things into videos so that they know I'm actually paying attention. And that's always a good way as well, which I believe brings us to the question part. I wanted to try to keep it tight so that you'd have a chance for questions. No, it's great. Oh, it's great. Thank you, Don. There oh. are some questions that came up in chat, but I think they've been answered by your team, which is pretty great. 
Yeah, I do have an amazing team. And I think I just got rid of our presentation. I thought I was giving you back control. Oh, that's okay. That I was going to actually, I will load it up because I do want to get that feedback. But um, I welcome people to unmute your, their mics and ask a question if they if they feel like they want to do that. Um, thank you, Don, for sharing your experiences. I know I'm I'm glad that it aligns with a lot of our advice, but I can the reason that is is because we've been working with you for a long time, and I think we've learned a lot about what Sakai's capabilities and limitations are, and probably want some of the better ways to navigate through it. Um, Similarly, there's lots of people in this chat who have so much experience that I've learned from uh, who've been doing really amazing things. So I want this to be an opportunity for you to connect with each other, not just it's not a one way through CPI. There's a lot of um, expertise here about different approaches. So please unmute while I load up that feedback form. I'm happy to hear. Uh, hopefully we have some more. So any questions at all? I think I see a hand up. Roberto, go ahead. Hi, Don. It's Roberto Nicol in Classics. Uh, can you give a bit more information about what you do with videos? Do you uh, do you use a introductory video? And if so, what are the instructions you give to students to introduce themselves in a short video? And lastly, do you have other uses of student video in your class? With the big numbers, I don't use a lot of student video. I have that option for some assignments. Uh, they haven't taken it up a lot. The I have an introductory video at the beginning of every module. And then in the orientation, I usually, what I've often done is played a game with them. I will record it on location somewhere. And one of the things I have to do in the quiz is guess where my recording location is. And so in that course orientation, I give them a video where I talk a bit about myself and how the course will run. Usually in the large courses, I have them use forums or chat to introduce themselves and do that piece. But if a smaller, a smaller course, you could probably have them do the videos in the same way and post them. So in a in a large class, you don't have the students then do like one minute introductory videos uh, in their seminar sections. The large courses that I run, I don't use seminars in the traditional sense, so they're in discussion groups. So I use the forum more. So, for example, when they first go into their service learning settings, they have to post in a service learning dialogue. What? Well, what they're getting out of their setting, what they were worried about going into it, how the first day went. But I, when I'm dealing with 450, I don't tend to have them do the videos. I keep them in smaller groups. So they all, they all have access to some things as large groups, but they tend to interact more in groups of 30. Thank you. Astrid has a question here about I don't know if this, so let's say uh, somebody went into forums and said, oh, this is a location for the answer. What, how do you, how, has that happened and how do you react to that? I think is the question. Uh, we have had one or two cases where somebody has posted something that we find is not appropriate either because they're giving away an answer that somebody's supposed to be finding. And we've just removed the comment and then we send a private email to the student. Thanks. That's a that's a good solution. Um, Ned is uh, saying it's, it might be helpful to how to run seminars in large classes, and that's a good point. Um, Madeline, I yeah, you agree. Madeline agrees. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, I I just saw that, and I was thinking through. Uh, how we could talk about different designs because I think like what Don was saying is that instead of doing you know everybody just shows up online and they have a seminar discussion what could those look like that are effective using async and synchronous if that's required in terms of they have to watch a video beforehand and then maybe they just go to forums and that's where they have their kind of synchronous discussion over um, you know a one day period so yeah I think that's a great idea and we could look at different ways and different kind of can um, like jigsawing that together and what that looks like. So we can, we'll take that one back. 
and they are running like the TA workshops are running how to do that. So it might be worth us having a broader conversation of what you have in mind before we give it like we're giving advice to TAs generally on how that can be done and some good strategies about building community and making sure that you're um, responsive and that you check in and that you ensure that no people aren't going off track. So there's some like very good leading practices that are kind of the key things that we we would always give as advice. But if there's something specific for your context, please reach out to us so that we can design something um, and keep that in mind. I think it would be really important and useful. Um, yeah, and even put it in that formative feedback uh, uh, document that uh, Julia has put the link up there for. Yes, yeah. so th three people already filled it out. Thank you to you three, but there's still uh, 29 of you. If you have any feedback at all, even if it's just sort of like that comment, that's a great thing that we can uh, can uh, do some design uh, for next week. So next week um, is our last technical week that we're going to be together. Um, so technical, yeah. And then we're going to kind of send you off and hope that you come to us individually and we can uh, design some things specifically in your context. But so this is your opportunity to design what you think that next or we should do next week. So please let us know. Yeah, and I do really think people need to consider redesigning. So is a seminar really what you want online or is it going to be some different, differently constructed idea of what a seminar might be like having the pre-recording that they watch and then having a shorter time when TAs can interact with them synchronously if that's what you're looking for so they have that more personal connection or moving it to the forum but think about what in this context is going to get you the biggest bang for your buck and get you to those um, learning outcomes that you want even if the path is not quite the path you thought it might be. Yeah biggest bang for your buck and, le and least mm -hmm. headache for your time. <laughs> <laughs> so we really don't want to um, make it more tech heavy or challenging than it needs to be. I think that's something that was clear in what Don was saying about like reduce the amount of technical overhead, simplify. Yeah, and, and just to let you know, the first year that we took that course online, because it was such a drastic change, we had a change.org petition that wow. was launched. And we had to... Um, so I actually used the form of the feedback and I said, no, you know, change.org is your, you know, freedom of speech, but I won't interact with that. Brock has policies and procedures that you can go through. So I put a questionnaire, anonymous questionnaire. I think, Julia, you actually helped me with that into the forums and the students filled it out. And then I did a video where I went through and talked about, so here are the concerns that came up. Um, I acknowledged the change.org petition, but said I wouldn't engage with it. But I was very interested in engaging in what students enrolled in the course and not somebody from Idaho had to say about the course. <laughs> Although I like the guy from Idaho because he just told them to suck it up and do the course. <laughs> and then we, wow. we went through what changes were going to be made. And funny, some of them are very cosmetic changes, but they gave the students a sense that I was being um, responsive and we actually did take some seriously some of the things that they were saying weren't working and we redesigned those pieces and That's so great. when something doesn't go well online it can not go well in a really big way that generates a lot of work in email yeah. so the more thinking you can put into the design um, the better and yes I could share I do a lot of reflective pieces both in the exams and in other pieces. And the module reflections are reflections. So every module they write and work on critical reflection. So are those, Don, are they uh, like 100 word type of reflections? Like I'm thinking big courses. How do you manage that in terms of oh, um, marketing? <laughs> there are tricks to it. We actually had it timed. So they are actually large. I think they're allowed to go either to 1300 or 1600. I'm trying to remember, I feel like it's 1300. But there is one particular section that we mark more heavily. So they write a one paragraph on instruction. Well, you can eyeball that. It, it's not high in my priority list. It's like more a check that they actually do it. Right. And then we have a piece where they write about some links that we've given them to practice using different theoretical lenses. Again, it's more intended for the practice. So it's a, the, the TAs essentially quickly eyeball that and go, okay, yeah, that looks about right. 
And then the bulk of it is in their reading reflection, which is about um, three to four paragraphs if they're doing well. And I think that's interesting from the perspective of having to do so much marking in large classes. It's where do you put your time? Like, is it a check-in that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? And, you know, they're getting some marks for that, but then where do you want your TAs to spend their, their marking hours is really uh, an important thing to think through. And that all links back to what you talked about with your learning outcomes, right? So I, I think that's, that's great. Thank you. There's another one here. Uh, Don, how many TAs grade a single assignment? assignment, uh, uh, consistency, etc. Yeah. They, the TAs are broken into the group. So we have consistency within the group. I do the training of the TAs and what they have to do is they have to mark to me. So it's a little top heavy at the beginning because I actually go through and before I release the grades, I remark about six of everybody's reflections. And then I give them feedback on that. So I take their top scores, their bottom scores, and some ones in the middle. And then I will alter the grades. And there are times when I've remarked whole seminars. And then I give the TA that feedback and let them know like where they're being too hard or where they're being too easy. And then all remarking is done by me. So before we had to go online, I had face-to-face -face office hours and students had to come to office hours, explain why they thought their module reflection hadn't been graded properly and I would grade it on the spot and, and go through a regrade because it is really designed. So a lot of areas are just that touch point and then there's more areas that are more attention for marking, which means we can move through those assignments quickly, but we're making sure that the students are working through the material that we want them to work through. So that's that's how I make sure consistency and usually by the third set of assignments that have come in, the, the graders are where they need to be and we're usually within 2% of each other. Okay, we just have one more question and then I think our time is up because I know a lot of people have to go on to other things, but Robert, Roberto is asking about uh, how detailed is your rubric that you share with students? Uh, I use a few different approaches. So I haven't always found that rubrics work well in certain online activities. So we used a rubric and thought it would help with our service learning dialogues, but it changed them into a numbers game with actually less reflective practice in it. Uh, what I do like to do instead of a rubric is go through, so I have a very clear expectation for module reflections. I saw that Lindsay posted that I actually mandate what headings that they use and then under each of those headings I tell them what should be in that section so it's not a it's more like a um, instructional guide but the marking follows it as well so it's not a traditional rubric but I give very clear expectations and then they're given feedback on everything so they're told what sections are doing well and then where they need to push and then I often will do so they know they can come to me and I'll actually go through their uh, critical reflection with them. And I can usually identify what their problem area is. So like there's ones where I talk to them, I say, OK, so you're a person who approaches the cliff and you won't jump off. Or, you know, you treat the readings like your safety blanket. So when I'm asking you to critically reflect on them, you're like, no, I want to describe it as I feel safe there. And so when I talk them through it and I give them a few strategies, then they try it and they usually come back and see me again. And then we work through until they're seeing the progress that they want to see. And what you'll find is if you're doing that, it's similar to the principle we talked about earlier about the students who need to be watered more often, just like you don't water your garden evenly. Or at least not each flower in the same way. A lot of them don't need it or they can take what assessment there is and the ones that do come in and, and engage and get that support. That's really helpful advice. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate it. I agree with about criteria and explicit instructions versus like a detailed rubric, which that does tend to happen. Um, but um, we ask you that, you know, do what, what suits you and we're happy to reach out 
uh, reach out and let us know if you need any support. I just want to point out that if you are ready to start building, please contact us. We're, we're ready to help you if you want to start doing that. Again, please provide the feedback. And um, a special thank you again, Don. Thanks for coming in and sharing your uh, experience. Uh, I really appreciate it. And look, some really good questions that I think was really great to get your, um, your insight on. I'm going to stop the recording now, finally. And... Um,